All right, we are live. <laughs> uh, joining me today is a very special guest, uh, Joshua Tan. Uh, so Josh, for those who don't know you, can you say a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, so my name's Josh Tan. I'm an astronomer um, at my home institution is LaGuardia Community College, just like you, but the um, astronomy uh, program at CUNY is based out of the American Museum of Natural History. So we have all of the research astronomers there, and also there are some now down at the Center for Computational Astrophysics in the Flatiron District, which is a new um, uh, Simons Foundation uh, Institute. So we kind of work on a lot of astronomy problems together, research in that way. Um, I have been here for now two years working on things. My main interest is actually neutron stars. And I kind of got interested in, um, I've always been very interested in science communication and uh, questions involving science in general. Um, and one of the classes I actually teach is uh, astrobiology at LaGuardia, which um, surprisingly touches on the subject of consciousness more than you might expect. Uh, the students have big questions and, and perhaps very legitimate questions about what the connection between consciousness and, for example, life right. might be. And so, um, so then we sort of got started, I guess, um, a few months back, and here I am. To <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> So it was that, I mean, just a, a follow up on that. Was that how you got interested in talking about consciousness? But it seems like you are were interested in before or like has there anything? I guess, um, so I've always been involved in public um, uh, science communication sort of thing. And uh, a lot of that involved um, trying to determine uh, what things you could say with certainty and what things you couldn't say with certainty about scientific facts. Right. Um, and so to that extent, actually before I became an astronomer, there was a brief period of time where I got very interested in the um, in comparative religion. And so spent huh. some time kind of looking into how that all played out, especially um, in the realm of um, uh, scientific understanding versus religious understanding I mean, things of that nature that was back when i was an undergraduate and i got real interested in that and then sort of ended up going into the um empirical side of things uh from there but then i've always been involved in outreach astronomers tend to do that a lot and so because of that you end up engaging a lot with some of these subjects. So I've spent quite a bit of time engaging with cosmology. I've spent quite a bit of time engaging with evolution as a subject. Um, and then quantum mechanics also is one of the things that ends up coming up. It's a subject that, you know, we study uh, to varying degrees. I mean, I've taken a number of classes and you know, use quantum mechanics to describe various things in, in my research. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm not, that's not my main uh, field of study, but it's certainly something that I was interested in when I saw your talk and saw that, you know, there was going to be this engagement because one of the things I had actually looked into were um, uh, uh, theories about consciousness and quantum mechanics being connected because Roger Penrose is something of, you know, he's one of the more interesting cosmologists right. out there. So I know him for his work in general relativity. And then he proposed, um, along with Stuart Hameroff, this idea related to um, consciousness and quantum mechanics being connected, which was, I would, I guess I could say charitably not received the most favorably <laughs> by people in the physics community. Um, and then there were some other sort of strange controversies that kind of brewed up around that maybe about 10 to 15 years ago right. uh, online. Um, that's kind of all settled down at this point, I would say, but it's always something that I've, I've stayed in touch with, I've engaged with. Um, and then I guess before I even went to your talk, there was a, um, I, I kind of got a, an interest in the subject again because Scientific American has been publishing sort of uh, blogs that are supposed ostensibly to be about scientific ideas and I 
took objection to a few of them that were about this subject as to whether they were actually scientific um, claims that were being offered. Uh, and so, so that I, was the, so you wrote a, um, I saw one that you wrote about the panpsychism, right? That was the, the yeah, response, so to that was a response to a, a blog that was written by uh, someone that, um, as far as I know, is not very well known in, in uh, either the philosophy nor the empirical side of the questions about looking at consciousness. Uh, but got his blog post published, had this sort of um, recasting. Uh, he didn't explicitly say in his blog post that it was panpsychism, but he referred to a paper that he wrote that definitely was panpsychism as a uh, uh, as a claim. And he tried to recast it in terms of emergence, which is an interesting idea that comes out of uh, physics. It was very popular, let's say, 30 years ago maybe a little bit less popular now than it was as a unifying uh, characteristic in physics. And, but that's, uh, uh, I, I took ex exception, I guess, to the way it was proposed um, in Scientific American. I, I made the claim that it wasn't actually a, a, a proposal that we could test. It was not, it was a not a testable proposal is what I said, that um, there would always be a way you could sort of find your way out of the weeds. <laughs> if someone said, oh, this is not what's going on, you could always propose another aspect of it that would allow for your panpsychism to, to reemerge, as it were. So um, that was kind of my criticism. So uh, Michael Lemonick uh, was kind enough. I don't think he agreed with me that he shouldn't um, engage with this sort of non-empirical side of things because he thinks that, I, I think his opinion is that this is an open question and you need to have uh, a wide range of opinions offered. Uh, but he was gracious enough to essentially publish my response with basically no edits at all. So that was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but so do you, I, I mean, because uh, I guess there's a lot of stuff I wanted to ask about. I'm not sure where to where to jump in at this point, but do you take falsifiability in general to be a criterion for a, like a scientific theory? I mean, and I have this, I have string theory in the, in the background, you know. In the, the. So I know that people that are in philosophy of science have kind of moved beyond this. And I think with good cause, um, I think it works as a nice heuristic, at least when I'm talking with students, um, I, I find that it, it helps uh, to kind of uh, eliminate certain misconceptions about things that um, may or may not be amenable to investigation scientifically. I guess that's the way I think of falsifiability. So I don't think of it as the full criterion necessarily mm -hmm. or um, something that could be relevant to a scientific idea. I think that there are sometimes proposals that are made which are not strictly falsifiable but that allow for a development that may um, uh, provoke scientific discovery and investigation so i'm hesitant to say that this is like a hard and fast criterion i'm not operating in that way right. on the other hand right. so I, I do think that it's extremely uh it's a it's, it's a big red flag <laughs> when i can't identify what something when something is falsifiable I think that that's a that's a good indication that something has um, that some sort of question has been asked that may not be answerable in an empirical way so I mean uh, notoriously in string theory we have a similar kind of issue arising so, yeah and mm -hmm. in cosmology in general I guess this would be something like eternal inflation so uh, Eternal inflation isn't something that looks like it's empirically testable, is it? But yet, it, yeah, it's, it's kind of this interesting question. So I always find this to be problematic in the sense that um, uh, if you look in the history of, I, I, I guess I use parallax often as the example. Uh -huh. So parallax of the stars was one of the big objections to Galileo. Uh, when he proposed that the earth went around the sun and his interlocutors said oh well there are no 
observations of parallaxes of the stars, the fixed stars, the ones that are very far away. Um, and so uh, this is uh, a problem with your model. And his response wasn't exactly satisfying. And you could argue that at that point, they didn't have the technology to observe the parallax of the stars yet. And so was the proposal that these parallax of the stars, Galileo acknowledged that they should exist, that you should have parallax. He just said that the stars were quite far away, although he misjudged um, exactly how far. He thought they were much closer than they actually were. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, interestingly. Um, I mean, he made a lot of interesting mistakes in his dialogues. With all the, the, the tides is the most famous. He was right. completely wrong about his explanation of the tides. <laughs> But in any case, um, but you, so if, if you imagine, like if we were having this discussion in Galileo's time, would we claim that parallax of the stars is an unfalsifiable hypothesis? Because we don't have any technology that can go measure this if it does exist, if we, these stars are so far away. So this might just be completely unfalsifiable. So I'm hesitant always to say that something is strictly unfalsifiable because we don't know what sort of breakthroughs and technologies are going to develop. And so, yes, right now, it's really hard to imagine how you might falsify string theory or how you might falsify certain internal inflation models. But that doesn't mean that they won't lend themselves to such treatments in the future, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm hesitant to predict that that's the case. So in this sort of battle between people who say string theory is not falsifiable, so it's not science, and those that say, you know, shut up, it is. <laughs> um, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. I don't know. It may very well be that the proposals that they're putting forth are not falsifiable, um, ultimately, like they may end up being in the realm of pathological science, you might say, something like where people continually change their ways of putting forth things. David Deutsch kind of does this idea, like you should have a model that you can't change very easily. That's kind of the mark of a good model. Right. And that, that's an interesting way of putting it, I guess. I, I mean, but string theory yeah. certainly fits that. Right, there's not a yeah, lot of mathematical because formalism. Depends on who you talk to, because some people there's this whole idea of the landscape, and there's like, you know. But I mean, the fundamental rules that generate the landscape. You can't, you can't, fun, uh, you can't. Mess no, with those but without it's getting it sort of remarkable. Like as, it, one of the big complaints about it is that any observation that's made um, probably can be accommodated. Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's the big problem, right? That's exactly. the problem, right? And so it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> Um, but there's also people who claim, no, there are no go theorems and there are areas that we could say, oh yeah, definitely. So, I, and I'm, this is also way beyond my wheelhouse. I'm not a string theorist. I don't delve into this very deeply. Um, but so I, I remain uh, extremely agnostic as to the question as to whether string theory is scientific or not. I am happy to let the string theorists work on their problems as much as they want to and try to propose things that we might do to make observations. I will say that Penrose kind of interestingly, even though I think that he's been wrong about certain things, is is pretty remarkably good at proposing ways to falsify his ideas. Like this yeah. is something he tries to do <laughs> as a matter of course. And I think people can uh, learn uh, and take a page from his book at doing things like that. Um, but, but can I just ask yeah. really fast why I, I, so what I'm not hearing you say, and I wonder if you would, is you're not saying it because you don't agree with it, or if you just uh, hadn't brought it up yet. But what I'm not hearing you say, or what I wonder what you would say about is, <clears throat> suppose that, you know, I take the Galileo point, that's falsifiable in principle or something. Mm -hmm. um, so suppose that string theory were not falsifiable in principle, not even in principle. Right. Wouldn't it still count as science given Yeah, that so that's the level where I would say that there you start to have a problem where it, even in principle, when something in principle is not falsifiable, that's where I start to say, yeah, this, this can't be a scientific claim at that point. Uh huh. So uh, you're not, you're not interested in the kinds of arguments, I guess, like Sean Carroll has argued and, uh, um, in philosophy and science, philosophy of physics, Richard Dawid, um, argued that we need some kind of, some other criteria for to evaluate theories as good or as being physically meaningful, um, which don't rely on falsifiability precisely because of things like the landscape and string theory. Um, yeah, I think maybe, 
So I, I don't know that I necessarily follow what Sean means when he says that, <laughs> because I think that it it's uh, fine to say, yeah, all right, we need other criteria in the meantime, but at some level you have to be able to um, say, uh, you know, this has some consequences <laughs> to what I can observe, right? And if you can't say that, then at, at what point is this description viable, right? Like, what are the other things that you're actually looking for at that level? Um, so yeah, I don't know that I necessarily follow completely what his idea is. Because yeah, all right, there's lots and lots of possibilities. And in some sense now, like in particle physics, um, you know, any observation that gets made, uh, no matter how tenuous, there will quickly be thousands of papers written about possible right. theories that can explain yeah. it. Um, but I don't think that that's um, saying that that means that particle physics is not falsifiable. I think it's still falsifiable. I just think that there are lots of different ideas about how you put together theories. Right. And that when you eventually what will happen is you eliminate the ones that you don't like, you follow the path down the ones that that seem to be correct, and they provoke new um, predictions, and that's where it becomes falsifiable. Right? It becomes so, falsifiable I mean, that it, it more like related to your, I think, area. When you talk about something like dark matter, dark energy, so how do you adjudicate between the people who say, "Look, um, what this is actually doing is falsifying Newtonian." Sure. Uh, Einstein's think Einstein's uh, theory of relativity yeah. mm -hmm. versus the people who say no, it's not. It's just something else out there called dark matter, dark yeah. energy. So we don't, know, we don't know which one it is. It could be either one at this uh -huh. point, point. and it's perfectly fine for it to be either one, right? It could be that uh, the theory is still fine, and there are new particles or new things that we haven't detected, or it could be that there is some problem with the theory on certain scales. Um, and but, yeah. I think that's kind of nice, leaving the mystery open because we really don't know what the solution is. At some point, someone will, uh, or if history is a guide, at some point, someone will discover uh, something that will point and, and lead us into the direction of saying, this is the explanation that's correct versus this other one. And there are strong hints that dark matter, for example, is probably something like a particle. Um, that seems that's I, I think it's the most popular explanation for a reason and, and that's probably too technical to get into but that's the kind of the um, I actually like having that kind of argument available and that there is not a resolution yet is, is um, uh, something that I think is a feature rather than a bug I see scientific. yeah because what I was trying to uh, bring out was that <clears throat> you, there's another kind of argument there. I, I like what you're saying about the, the openness and you know scientific attitude, being humble and not not knowing. And I like that. But why isn't there another kind of thing you could suggest, which is that the general theory of relativity is so well confirmed in almost so many other areas yeah. that it would just be a great cost to have some modified Newtonian dynamics or whatever, yeah. you know, to, to junk it. And so there's other considerations beyond whether, you know, um, it's strictly falsifiable or not that suggests that this is actually the better theory and should be preferred over modifying um, it in some way. Why isn't that one, another one of these kinds of non uh, empirical considerations. I guess us. I'm I'm a big fan of regimes, so uh -huh. I really do think that uh, explanations depend on the context that you're trying to make them in. And so the obvious comparison is then to the revolution that happened the, about a hundred years ago with general relativity versus Newtonian gravity. You could have made exactly the same argument. These are tiny problems. The precision, the extra precession of the perihelion of Mercury is right. kind of <laughs> something we should be worried about. Exactly. And gravity is incredibly accurate as a predictor. Uh, and people were right to say those sorts of things. But it turns out that there are strong fields that um, change the fundamental way that gravity works. and. Uh, you recover Newtonian gravity from general relativity, right. but it um, 
requires a mat modification. Newtonian gravity is at fundamentally not correct in, in those regimes, and you can show why. And any explanation that would modify gravity to account for dark matter or dark energy or any of the other sort of mysteries that are out there in astrophysics will have to recover all of the wild success that general relativity has enjoyed uh, at some level. So I, I don't think it's enough to just say, oh, it's been successful, let's keep it as is, because the regimes that we might be testing gravity in at this point are different than the regimes that it was originally um, uh, proposed uh, in relation to. And right. the observations that Einstein had available mm -hmm. to him were not of galactic and galactic cluster scales and cosmological right, exactly. scales. Yeah. No, that, yeah, I, I take that point. So just to not get too sidetracked by this, but to bring it back to something related to the consciousness point, which is what this was all about to mm -hmm. begin with. Um, there's a kind of, I think on your part, willingness to be patient with respect to things like string theory and not with respect to something like panpsychism. So yeah. I, I'm wondering what what is in your mind the thing that makes the one a serious thing we should wait around for and the other one something that you can say, oh, uh, we won't ever develop a way that we could test this. Um, yeah, so I guess to me, I guess if I was gonna identify the problem with the proposals I have read so far with panpsychism is as I see them as being eminently adaptable to any sort of scenario that you would come across. So. I guess the idea is that I, I can't come up with an explanation that would pull you away from that. If I were to talk to someone that was a panpsychic um, proponent, yeah. and I would say, what would be the thing that would that you would be able to observe that would convince you that panpsychism was wrong? I don't know that I could get a response from them that I would agree with. And in that sense, there are there are people that are kind of uh, stick in the muds when it comes to things like um, alternative theories of gravity, for example, who act very similarly. Right. And I think yeah. they're equally incorrect, right? <laughs> when I talk about some of these people that are like, oh, it's modified Newtonian dynamics till the day I die, it, they have a real hard time accommodating some of the uh, observations that seem to um, be problematic for that sort of treatment. Um, and to that extent, you know, I also have a problem with them. What I can do is I can see, because perhaps I'm more familiar with the, the literature and the like ways that these ideas have developed, places where you can pick out the important things that they're saying, sort of the general principles, the ideas, um, and then say, you know, you can, you know, sort of have this, or at least whatever the ultimate solution to this mystery will, will have um, something that can explain this really interesting aspect that they're pointing out and then get rid of some of the other sort of, as I said, stick in the mud sort of behavior and, you know, the stuff that I can easily say, all right, you know, you're never going to accept that dark matter is a particle, no matter, you know, even if I hold one in my hand and give it to yeah. you. <laughs> So that, so yeah, so that's the way I approach the subject, I guess, generally is that that's, Whenever I've been reading about people who, propose, who are a proponent of panpsychism, that's the sense I get. And that may be because I haven't read the right stuff or I might not be as immersed in, in being able to pick out the, the uh, things that they actually are saying that might be um, something you could latch on to. Right. Um, but so, uh, that, so it could be my own ignorance, but that's the comparison that I see is that it's just something that can't, uh, that that is not going to be able to uh, ever be shown to be wrong by anybody, as far as I can tell. Right. So, so, so I mean, yeah, I would. You can make a comparison to like Freudian psychoanalysis. Yes, <laughs> actually, that was, I was thinking about that the other day. That that's very similar. The story here seems very similar to me to psychoanalysis. Right. Yeah. I was. Yes. So I wonder now. This came up in some of our early discussions, so I wonder if I could press you a little bit on this. And I, just for the record, I, I don't know if anyone cares, but I'm not trying to defend panpsychism. Mm -hmm. I'm not a <clears throat> panpsychist. I'm pretty old-fashioned, like identity theory materialist. That's and I, you know, 
don't know if that's true or not, but that's where I would like things to work out. Uh, so, you know, I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to get clear on what the methodological issues are yeah. and, you know, what we're, uh, what counts as evidence and stuff like that. So I, I think that the people who, because I talk to panpsychists, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, some of them care about science, a lot of them actually. And I think when you ask them, like, why are you a panpsychist? Why, why, why not just the brain or why not just, you know, functionalism yeah. or whatever your alternative view is, they tend to say things like, oh, consciousness as experienced by me from the first person has a certain quality to it that I just mm -hmm. can't understand how that thing could be physical. And then they could get more complicated, yeah. like there be zombies or whatever. But the basic thing that gets them is like the thing that I have when I have consciousness is something which seems in its nature not to be compatible with the way that physics and the physical sciences describe reality, but yet we know it's perfectly real. So I wonder now you, I guess you're going to say that that doesn't count as a kind of evidence or, well, or that we shouldn't take it seriously. I don't understand that that opinion is an opinion and it's a, it's a perfectly fine opinion. But I could equally say that opinion about almost anything. Like I could say that about gravity, right? My experience of gravity doesn't seem to comport with the explanations that people offer for it. I don't think GR is correct, therefore, right? And so to me, it's kind of like, all right, I don't know what to do with that sort of argument because well, I- Well, yeah, you do though. You would explain to the person how given the forces as described in GR, uh, and brains as such as theirs lead to experiences like theirs, even though right. this is what's really going on. So you would, you would, you would be able to take a scientifically minded, literate person and convince them that yeah, the sun is not rising; we're actually rising. Yeah, and it just you experience it this way, and they would come to understand that. But can you do this? I mean, I don't think you're going to be able to do the same thing. Yes, yeah, so that's always been the claim: is that you can't do the same thing for someone who argues in this way, maybe because. Um, there's the mysteries that are still involved in consciousness are maybe too too uh, close to our own experiences or too easy to access in comparison, right? The mysteries that are still evident in general relativity are pretty technical at this right. level, right? And so yeah. it's much easier to kind of say, well, everyday experience is totally explained. Whereas maybe, I, I would agree that everyday experience is not totally explained in the sense that we don't have a one-to-one -one explanation for, you know, uh, experience versus uh, cause effect kind of arguments. Um, but I also don't think that there's been a convincing um, story that uh, this is impossible to do, right? And so at that point, you know, it is sort of a level of, all right, well, we have to kind of shelve the question at that point, because for me, you know, then it becomes, now we're trying to like debate between two different ideas for which we don't have strong evidence, but we're trying to pull on past understanding of how the history of ideas and things developed. And so that's where I start to like pull out ideas that Carl Sagan comes up with and things like, all right, which is the simpler explanation? Is the simpler explanation that consciousness rise in the brain or is it that consciousness is inherent to all matter? And then you have to have that discussion, right? Like that argument, is it, is it, <laughs> is it simpler one way or the other? And, and it's, not, it's not clean, right? It's not right. a simple way to kind of do this. But I think when I, when I kind of evaluate it at that level, um, it's, it's easy to maintain this sort of, um, I guess, non-materialist position whenever you have a mystery that you can um, hold on to uh, as, as, I guess, viscerally as consciousness is, right? And so right. that's the way it's, it, it, it appears to me. But, but, my, but so do you, do, do you, I mean, I, I think you're sympathetic with like Dennett and uh, some of these other am, yeah. characters out there. Mm -hmm. So um, do you, from your own just personal day-to-day -day experience, do you not find any traction at all when philosophers talk about phenomenal consciousness? And yes, do exactly. you just find that mysterious? Or yeah, I do. I find it totally mysterious. And even when I try to like um, give it the benefit of like, all right, I'm going to try to understand exactly what's 
meant by this. It, I just can't shake the fundamental um, idea that it could easily be all in the brain. Like I just can't, <laughs> I can't wrap my head around how someone could be so convinced that it is impossible for that to occur. That they would that they would sort of say, all right, we're gonna have to answer all this other stuff. Um, uh, and I sometimes ask myself why that might be the case. Like, why is it that for me, is it just because of my training? Is it because of like other questions that I've investigated? You're clearly a zombie. <laughs> yeah, I, but I mean, but I mean, I think the zombie thing is interesting, but I also think it's something of a like, it's, it's kind of just an object lesson more than anything else. We don't really know that that's a legitimate way of describing what consciousness is. Um, and the people that study like neuroscience are kind of not really, they don't really care. Or a lot of them, it seems that I've investigated their work, don't really care about what the answer to that question is in a sense. Um, some of them do, but I, I some understand. Of them do, but a lot of the yeah. like actual work that's being done in, in doesn't take it into account. Is, is completely agnostic to that question. You know? Yeah. Like, like, it's also completely agnostic to the question of idealism, though. Right. And, yes. Um, it, right. But as is like all of science in a sense. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like we don't, we don't really care what the fundamental thing that's going on may or may not be as long as we have this sort of description that works uh, or, or. Right. I, mean, I think this is really the, the central turning point of the disagreement because, you know, the one, the, to the extent that I do agree with the Chalmers type mm -hmm. arguments against materialism um, is to, to the extent that I find some kind of pull from this, uh, the first person sense of acquaintance or whatever the fancy word you want to use with my own experience. It's not that I find it impossible that it could be physical. In fact, I spent a lot of time arguing, actually, it's quite possible and, and so yeah. forth and so on. But, but I, I do think that at the first encounter, there's a, well, you need, you need a connecting theory. You need something that allows you to understand how it could be physical. Because when you just think about like, oh, my experience of red or the taste of chocolate or that I'm drinking coffee right now or the blue of this shirt, um, there is a fun, there is a something there which seems special. It doesn't seem right off the bat like it could be uh, mathematized or expressed mathematically. Um, just seems kind of to have a different thing going on. It's qualitative. <laughs> it's yeah. not quantitative. But but the yeah. other and the difference between that and the other stuff, which you can always say, yeah, but what about that other stuff? That that the difference is that the, all that other stuff can be characterized in terms of some kind of function or in terms of the structure that it has. So you can always, like this is the thing people always just say about life. Oh, well, life used to be mysterious. But it, that's not really true. It was mysterious, but people, people knew that there were just certain, and I know you talk a lot about this a lot in your class, so I want to broach the, them together. But mm -hmm. people talked about, well, there are these certain functions. There's reproduction, there's copying. But how could anything that's merely biological perform those functions? And then once we had a theory of how those functions could be done biologically, life was less mysterious from the point of view of science. But the question at the beginning was already one that you could see how, well, if there were something that did that function, then it would be doing life. But it's not clear that there's anything like that that you can say for experiencing red or having... Yeah. Um, I mean, emotional. I I just can't get over the sort of astonishing hypothesis proposal that every thought is a, a, a forty hundred thought synapse, right? Like I cannot, I, I cannot like that. To me, is the sort of equivalent to what you're saying when you're talking about biological function, right? That that is what the sort of materialist would come back with. They would just say, all right, well, you know, your experience of a qualitative understanding of whatever phenomena you want to talk about is fundamentally a synapse. It's a it's a reaction to a synapse that that experience maps on to that. And it may be complicated and difficult to even 
um, come up with the full explanation and we can return to life too. Because I think that there actually are still mysteries with respect to what life is that aren't very well uh, accounted for. Not even, not even that they're not even well accounted for. I think ultimately it's a problematic category. It's actually a sort of a category here um, to talk about life versus non-life in a weird way. And that may very well be the same thing that happens with consciousness, that it uh -huh. could be a category error to think that this is um, something that is empirically, that there's an empirical phenomena that we can easily map the idea of consciousness onto. Um, and I mean, there's lots of stories about, you know, things that develop that way in science where we thought it was a thing and then it wasn't a thing or we thought it was a, yeah. Um, and like so that, that may be, that's uh, another huge possibility that I am willing to entertain. And it feels a little bit like there's the, the groups that I am sort of most in disagreement with are not willing to entertain that as a, as a possibility. Um, that either it's going to be completely separated from empirical reality so that no one will ever be able to sort of tell me that this doesn't exist. Um, I guess those are the people that don't like zombies or something like that. And then, or that, um, you know, there's got to be some other explanation that's beyond the physical descriptions that there's going to be this other, I don't know, artifice that's going to be developed and then we're going to be able to interact with it over in this universe and you can have your physical universe over here sort of thing. Sorry. Yeah, I dropped something. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, yeah, so... I mean, because I mean, I don't want to uh, move past this because I, I don't think that there's going to be a lot of a, a ways to convince anyone who doesn't already yeah. on, on your uh, side about this debate here. But I mean, so one side of the debate sees in the things that need to be explained the existence of consciousness, and the other side, I think, what I hear you saying is that. The other side is open to the idea that maybe consciousness isn't in the list of things that need to be explained, like yeah, in it, terms it, of yeah. real existing things in the world or having. Um, or uh, maybe very comfortable with just it being an open question and not really knowing what the answer is, yeah. but kind of assuming like normal that the answer is gonna kind of develop in the same way answers have typically developed with uh, things that have observable consequences, that sort of thing. Like, it's not going to be a unique case. It's going to be the same sort of thing that we've had in the past. Yeah. Right? If we're talking about life or gravity or, I don't know, uh, deep time, whatever you want to talk about. You know, we had questions, and then we slowly start to develop explanations. It's going to, right, yeah. Um, I, I generally have that hope as well. Uh, I, I just was wondering if, like, you agreed in, to any extent that there's something seemingly interestingly special about consciousness. But it sounds like you're saying, yeah, you're, you're I think there's something person. mysterious, but I don't think it's unique. In I think the same mystery applies to anything we don't understand in, this, right, so, yeah. in that sense. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about life for a little bit, um, sure. if you don't mind, because you were just mentioning that. So, yeah. uh, you know, I, I saw this very interesting presentation that you gave about, uh, basically you said it was like the first four lectures of your oh, life yeah. in the universe class. It was on on YouTube or somewhere. Yeah. somewhere. Um, so I, I sort of know the general positions that you take, but uh, I wonder, so you can do a little bit of an introduction about what you think life is, yeah. um, why we want to focus on looking for biological life like ours and uh, us things of that nature. And then I want to ask you some questions if you don't mind about it. So, yeah, so I actually disagree with the functional definition of life to an extent because uh, I think it's easy to problematize it. And the examples I typically give are stars. Other people use computer programs to do this. Way. Right. I like the idea that a star, almost any kind of list of functions that we want um, living things to have, you can find something that people will agree is not living. In general, people will agree, not everybody, but in general, people will agree is not living. That you can make an argument that those functions actually occur within that particular system, and a star is a great example. So like a star has um, an ability to reproduce in a way, and a star has um, 
uh, something that's akin to uh, homeostasis, although we don't call it homeostasis, we call it equilibrium, and right, like there's these things that you can easily make the analogy from one side to the other. Um, and so it's not that I actually think that the functional definition is particularly problematic, it's just that our kind of assumption about life is um, anthropocentric. We're, we assume things that are alive that are similar to us, that developed in the same environments and the same pathways that we ourselves developed. Uh, but there's no reason to assume necessarily that that is a universal condition, um, that everything will develop in this fashion that we might decide to call living versus non-living. And I think fantastic examples of this are things like viruses and prions, right. which most biologists will argue is not, are not alive, but is somewhat problematically so. And there are biologists will, which will make the alt alternative argument as well. Um, and so to some extent, I think it's kind of a not, not an interesting question our virus is alive. It's like, that's just not, um, it, it's no longer sort of the thing that is uh, uh, most interesting about viruses um, or really anything that you're trying to describe that may be the, the subject of biology, whether or not it's alive. And I think some of this is a historical uh, baggage that we're carrying with us because that was a big question, let's say, as late as the 19th century. People were trying to figure out whether there was this like Elan Vital that like animated things and made things living and how would you describe this? And there is actually some interesting ways of thinking about how life operates in a systems fashion that's different than things that are not alive in a general sense. Um, that you can kind of have fun with um, that that may even somehow in kind of weird ways be connected back to consciousness. Um, and a lot of that has to do with discussions of entropy and you know, people get excited about all these sorts of things, free energy definitions of life, which I think are um, intriguing and, and, and worthy of consideration, if not necessarily fully developed yet. Um, but I think the, so then ultimately what ends up happening is we just sidestep the question. And so we say, all right, it, rather than try to answer this question about what is alive, what is not alive, we try to be as expansive as possible for our own experience and say, okay, essentially everything we know that's alive has nucleic acids and proteins, <laughs> right? Those are the two things that things that are alive have. So that's kind of the definition that we end up adopting when we um, launch space probes that explore other planets. Like ultimately that's the sort of thing we're gonna be sensitive to um, if and when, or if you know, we uh, discover life on Mars, for example, it will be that sort of life. Right, we're looking for like Martian bacteria. We're or looking something. for maybe not even bacteria, right? Maybe that they're, you know, any sort of like, like little bits of nucleic acid would be a Nobel Prize worthy, you know, sort of discovery sort of uh, argument that you can uh, think about. Like maybe you won't even find life, but just the detritus of it or something like that. You won't know. Um, but there's a real risk there because we've focused so much on, you know, Earth's biology that we'll miss something that's, um, we, might describe as life, but doesn't function the same way. Right, something or, without DNA, but that is virtually identical. Right, and so people talk about, you know, well, okay, other kinds of nucleic acids, or things that are not carbon-based, or things that use solvents that aren't water, but it, it's, it's still very limiting because you're still operating under the sort of basic assumption that life behaves in this sort of chemical, soupy way. Right. That may not necessarily be the case. There could be uh, uh, amazingly intricate and interesting conscious things that are out there that um, don't have any of those characteristics and we may completely miss them uh, because we're focused on our own sort of understanding of biology. Uh, but 
on the other hand, it's, it's not very easy to understand how you would go about exploring those other areas. Yeah. So without a place to start, you might as well start with what you know. And so it's a perfectly reasonable endeavor and I support it for uh, fully, uh, fully to do these sorts of things. But I, um, I think it's important to be aware that there's a fundamental problem with that assumption um, which is that we're basing it entirely on our own selves, right? Not necessarily on the vast uh, possibility space that exists out in the universe. And if there's one thing we know from our limited experience is that nature's cleverer than us. So if there's yeah. vastly different uh, stuff out there. It's not too hard to imagine it doing something yeah. interesting. <laughs> so that's so, kind so of the way. The so way I approach it, yeah. Your so I yeah okay, that's good to know because I guess I interpreted what you were saying in that um, talk of yours as well. This is what life is, so let's look for that. But really, what you're saying is this is just kind of a pragmatic thing. This mm -hmm. if it, if there's ever a place where the street light metaphor was a good idea, yeah. this is it. Like we're the, we're the drunk guy in the street light, but actually there's no other place to look. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah, uh, we don't know where we drop the keys, or even if there are keys. <laughs> right. Right. That's that's the way I approach it, and it's it's kind of encouraging in a way that you know, you know, if you're going to talk from a probabilistic standpoint, that a lot of the stuff that we're interested in, in terms of the anthropocentric version of life, is available in other locations. So that's kind of you know encouraging in a sense, um, but it's not at all clear to me that this is the only pathway available. Um, uh, and there's a lot of other pitfalls too, which I know you've been, you like to point out that like definition of the habitable zone, for example, is one that you say is what we're making a simplifying assumption there, but we're risking again, overlooking all sorts of interesting possibilities. Right. So this is, um, yeah, it's, <laughs> again, it's the same situation. You have to start somewhere. So you sort of start with an assumption that you have something like Earth functioning with like a carbon cycle the way Earth's does with an atmosphere that's about the same as Earth's. It's a lot of things yeah. that are similar to Earth that you're relying on. And all of the planets we've discovered, we can't say word one about their atmospheres or carbon cycles. So, you know. We're basing everything on like the size of that. It's a total, <laughs> yeah, we're basing everything on uh, from the, the location the and then somewhat on a size, but uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of hand waving at that level. Cause even then it's hard to really measure the sizes um, uh, accurately enough to kind of make judgments about what might be possible for even a surface of a planet, right? Like if we discover an extra solar planet, do we know for certain that it's rocky versus right. watery versus gaseous? Not really. We have some understanding, right? We have some parameterizations of our ignorance, but at the end it's, it's such a difficult thing to just detect the thing in the first place that we really don't have an explanation uh, that's uh, pretty straightforward that fashion and it can also be misleading right like um, uh, some of the more interesting places to look for life in our own solar system are nowhere near the habitable zone so right <laughs> that's just the way it is right? it, it's very possible to imagine that the conditions are better or um, uh, at least uh, available in um, situations that are very different than Earth's particular situation so, so then can I ask, because uh, one of the questions that I was wondering was, given the package of commitments that you're defending, uh, but again, all of which I'm mostly sim sympathetic to, but uh, just to probe what your position is here on this. Um, so suppose, you know, that we did discover in the course of our investigation some kind of exotic, non-nucleic acid-based system that mm -hmm. behaved in seemingly intelligent ways. Um, what behavioral criteria would convince you that the thing was conscious? Since oh, that cool. seems to be an important <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean yeah. a hard question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it has to be called the hard problem of consciousness. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I mean, it seems like you're committed so to there being some the kind of The only thing I can land on in that sense is, again, a, um, uh, 
a streetlight analogy, which is that technology, for better or worse, is what we uh, have used as our determination for intelligence here in the biological world. So it would be a technological question mm -hmm. from, my, from my perspective. Is this um, unknown entity producing technology that I can interact with? And that's extremely problematic because we're in a very narrow range of technology. As this is the thing I always point out. This is, this is actually my favorite resolution to the per Fermi paradox, um, where are all the aliens, which is that they're all um, either much uh, less advanced or all much more advanced than us. And we're only sensitive to the very narrow range of technology that we are and everybody else is somewhere else in the parameter space. Um, and the analogy I sometimes use is broadband versus narrowband radio communication. Um, if you were to broadcast a broadband radio signal in when Marconi was first developing the radio, they would mistake it for static. Like no one would know that you actually produced a technology that was um, intelligent. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's a problematic thing to fall back on, but that's the only thing I can think of um, personally that I can hang my hat on. And so, you know, hopefully with enough rolls of the dice, you like hit it, like winning the lottery. And oh yeah, they have, you know, the same uh, ability to produce. Oh, there's all kinds of weird ideas. Like, you know, we've come across the idea that it's now possible for human beings, if we wanted to, to build an optical laser that could outshine the sun at specific wavelengths. So maybe someone will do that. And so then we go around looking for these optical lasers that other, you know, and it, it's very much a like lottery game at that point. But that's the best that I can do is if you're going to try to identify what I think would be a, a mark of intelligence. And I think that th that's the only way I can get at what we're meaning by consciousness would be some sort of intelligence. Um, then it's going to have to be a technological match. Uh, otherwise, I'm not sure how. I, like, communication is just problematic without technology, as far as I can tell. I don't know how else you kind of look into that. Um, but so if you, if, you, if you stabbed it with a knife and it made a strange noise and scuttled into the corner, that's not going to be evidence that it felt pain? Uh, if you stab it with a knife and it runs into the corner, um, I think that's evidence for pain. Um, but I think we're, I guess, I guess the way I am problematizing it is that this is something that is so totally outside the like realm of our own biological, um, perspective that it would be hard for us to de determine whether it was even alive, let alone whether it was conscious, right? Right. And so, yeah, you stab it with a knife and then the knife turns into a flower. Like, how do you, <laughs> it's that, it's like, I don't, I don't know what the reaction would be. So if the reaction happens, right, where it's very similar, like in science fiction, right, where like everything is similar to human beings, <laughs> yeah. then yeah, then the question becomes a lot more straightforward. But I, have a hard time imagining that it's going to be that simple. I, right. have, I have an easier time imagining that we're going to actually have a problem identifying it in the first place. And then like, so then the question becomes, well, how can you cast your net as broadly as possible? And the best I can come up with is technology. And even that is problematic is kind of the way. I think of it. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, so I, I mean, I could keep asking about this forever, but I wonder if we could actually, if you would mind if I sort of segue into talking about, uh, the quantum mechanics and consciousness. Sure, question, yeah. Because that was one of the things that uh, started this discussion. But uh, mm -hmm. there's too many interesting things to talk about. Yeah. Um, but of course, so uh, once again, I'm. I guess I would defend more this idea than I would panpsychism. Mm -hmm. um, even though there's some stuff in the panpsychist stuff that I'm sort of sympathetic to. Oh, is that my beeping or you beeping? That's mine. And oh, okay. Turn it off. So let me see if I. Sorry can. about that. <laughs> no, it is. <laughs> Uh, but, but so that was the uh, the impetus for this was a talk that I gave and mm -hmm. you were at where I was basically just arguing that the idea that consciousness plays a role in collapsing the wave function, um, a causal role, is um, 
is a serious idea that's at least on par with the other kinds of interpretations mm -hmm. that you find in quantum mechanics. And so you wanted to say you were against that, that it's not a serious idea. So I'm, I'm curious a little bit. So I know you, first of all, just by way of getting in the realm, I know your criticism of like the uh, Penrose and um, Hammeroff stuff that, that comes from Techmark, right? Um, and that Max's work mm -hmm. involving decoherence. So first of all, I, I wonder if you could say a little bit something about that, because I, I think I don't really agree with the point that you're making here. But it may be, I'm not an expert, obviously, so I, yeah. I, I want to know what exact point you're making and see if we... Uh, so I think, so I don't know if you've uh, encountered tag marks. Oh, this does not work at all. Let's try, hold on, let's see. <laughs> to turn off... Um, Notifications. Yeah, that's where I'm in, but it's just not listening to me. Yeah, someone... Do not disturb, please. It wouldn't be a good discussion if there weren't some technological. Uh, you were just saying technology is a sign of intelligence. Um, now I'm doubting that. <laughs> yeah. So I have to tune it to disturb on, but we'll see if that actually is what it's intended. Okay. Uh, it looks like it worked. Okay. So, um, yeah. So did you read Max Tegmark's like rejoinder and then the like subsequent like seeing the whole back and forth? Debate, yeah. Um, so I think Max makes a good point that's specific, but he also is attempting, and I think he just doesn't care to go into it in great detail, to make a more general point, um, which is that quantum mechanics is fundamentally a very microphysical um, explanation. And the, the scales at which it's relevant are um, essentially ones of energy and um, size for the most part, uh, at least when you get to the things that uh, cause people to get sort of intrigued, right? Yeah, you have to be different. talking about small things and you have to be talking about um, certain uh, energy regimes, at least if you're interested in doing system uh, relevant things uh, that are quite different than what happens in biological systems, which is not to say that there are not quantum mechanical effects within biological systems, but there are fundamental things which make biology a classical system as a, as a, as a general rule. And the strongest uh, argument is one about decoherence, which is to say that um, the effects of quantum mechanics to the extent that particles uh, behave like waves, and incidentally, every particle, according to quantum mechanics, and everything that has mass behaves like a wave, or anything that has momentum, I guess we should say, behaves as a wave. Um, the extent to which you can um, look at the phenomenology associated with those waves is the extent to which uh, you can avoid this problem of decoherence, um, which is to say that things end up behaving a lot more like particles complemented in the complementary way, right? They no longer are entangled. They're now separate things. They go their separate world with lines and they don't have this kind of spooky connection that was um, provoked in the quantum world. And so this is the argument that actually I think Tegmark and I don't know if he would agree with me because he's a, a somewhat argumentative person, but he's very funny. <laughs> uh, but I think that's actually sort of the larger point he's making, which is that this is um, the kind of problem you're running up against whenever you try to do something functional in this way with quantum mechanics. And I would largely agree with that. I think that that's the fundamental thing you have to get around if what you want to do is apply quantum mechanics at a larger scale, at least in terms of the ideas that Penrose and Hammeroff, which we're doing, which were essentially that there's uh, effects happening at the neurological level that right. are causing consciousness to emerge in that way. Yeah, I mean, their, their view is a little even more radical. I mean, uh, on for Penrose and Hammerhoff, their view is that whenever there's spontaneous collapse, so first of all, Penrose has to modify the equations of uh, quantum mechanics that get spontaneous collapse 
when involving gravity or something weird like that. But as soon as there's collapse, they think that there's consciousness. And then what the microtubules do, according to them, and what and what I you know, I'm not defending them obviously, but uh, what the microtubules do is to organize those little bits of consciousness into what we call our stream of consciousness. But they're, they're, that view is a panpsychist view in that every time there is a collapse, there's um, consciousness and there's collapse all the time. It's just not always done in brains. Um, but but my so and I don't really the specific stuff. I mean about microtubules and stuff. I don't know about that stuff and um, mm -hmm. not really that doesn't seem important. The more general point though I worry about though, and that's the um, the role of decoherence. So as far as I understand it, <laughs> which is only so far as the research, I'm, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not a phys physicist, but I spent a lot of time trying to figure this stuff out. So as far as I understand decoherence, um, it's a basically a mathematical tool for determining when classical approximations become good enough. Um, That's so a way to think of it. Yeah, it can work, but I th it's also a physical phenomenon. Too. Well, there's a, I think there's a question about whether it's a physical phenomenon. So if you take a Copenhagen or a different kind of a, um, a doxastic interpretation, then it's not going to be, an, it, it may just be not a real physical process. I think it depends on the way that you're interpreting it. But but suppose it is a real physical process. Well, I mean, I guess the way I would say that it certainly is, is people who, for example, run quantum computers, this is the big problem that they have, is that their system um, undergoes decoherence, essentially. And so you start with an entangled state, and suddenly the state is no longer entangled. Right. Because you have either unintentionally introduced some sort of energy into your system or, you know, all sorts of things can cause things to go wrong. But basically you've removed the quantum mechanical effect that you were looking for is another way of saying it. It's not, I mean, so there's, there are sort of strong um, models of how decoherence happens and get into the nitty gritty of it. But I think ultimately it's just sort of the statement that, um, there is a difference between how things operate under quantum mechanics and how things operate classically. And there can be situations. So a, 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 an obvious place to look at the uh, uh, decoherence would be in the two slit experiment when you put a detector on one of the slits and right. like eliminate the, that's decoherence. Uh, like that's one off and that's a physical phenomenon. It actually happens. So so in that sense, I would say decoherence occurs. There might be a more grander sense in which it's like a kind of no-go sort of thing. And I don't know that I'm even willing to entertain that as a strong um, point. And I think that's, that's, that's the way so, Eggmark approached it. He was like, oh, decoherence so. is the no-go theorem. But I think there's a more general question that you can ask yourself, which is that under what regimes do quantum, does quantum mechanics apply? And, is it, you know, what? I, I, I had to, yeah, I mean, so there's a lot that's interesting in what you're saying, but I just want to jump in really quickly okay. because, I, I mean, certainly in the first instance, I, I understand what you're saying because decoherence in the most general sense is loss of coherence of the wave packet. And so obviously if you put a detector at the slits and you get the classical probabilities back, that's decoherence because mm -hmm. you've lost the, the coherent, uh, um, pack, package of information in the wave packet, but um, so there are two things that I'm, I guess that are getting mixed up. I not mixed up, but I think that are running closely together in what we're talking about. So one is the uh, emergence of the classical world. Like why, why isn't the world that we observe like the world described by the Schrodinger equation? Right. Um, and decoherence doesn't answer that question as far as I understand it. So what, what the math of decoherence does for you is it says that when the thing interacts with the environment, it becomes entangled in the environment. So you would have to measure the larger system, namely the thing that you are interested in now and the environment as well. So it's not that the, the wave nature has gone away it's just that you would need to do different measurements in order to detect it. And it would have to involve the, the environment 
um, or the measuring. So the classical way to put it, it had to, you know, the measuring apparatus itself would have to be part of the quantum mechanical system at that point because it's entangled with it. And more generally, it's entangled with the environment. So I, I don't think it's, I'm not sure it's actually right to say that, well, you just get a classical world from it. Um, what you get is a coherent set of histories or you can sign a trajectory to, to a, a certain particle. But you, so it's not clear that you do get classical, you get things that kind of look classical um, to the point where you could ignore the quantum mechanical corrections, I guess you'd say. But that doesn't mean that a collapse has occurred because as I understand the math gives you a, a diagonalization of the density matrix. So in other words, what you get is a superposition of that various outcomes, namely that you, it went through this slit and you detected it here and it went through this slit and you detected it there. So there still is a superposition just at the larger level. Yes, I think I actually agree with what you're saying in the sense that the quantum mechanics does not just disappear. That's absolutely the case. However, I think it might be a distinction without a difference or the difference without a distinction. <laughs> I don't know which one it is. Um, and the way I think of it is just sort of in the sort of uh, mean de Broglie sense. Uh, when you become entangled with the environment, your wavelength just becomes impossible to measure because it's too tiny, right? So all of these quantum mecha mechanical effects that you're looking for are occurring at scales that are just inaccessible to our measurement systems. And to right. the extent that a thought is a measurement, uh, that's my expectation, that you're going to be interacting with things that are for all intents and purposes acting classically. That's the kind of way. And it's not that quantum mechanics but they, disappeared, it's just that it is now in a regime under which you know, you're, not you're not able to access the uh, interference pattern in the way you know you would like to get these kind of interesting entanglements that right. everyone is attracted to because it's a different way of reality interacting I guess that's the way I think of it so I don't think I disagree with that point I just don't think that it is one that you can sort of say all right so that this keeps open the possibility that quantum mechanics could be acting somehow here I just don't think it does. I think it's there, but I don't think it gives you the stuff that, that people are looking for. It doesn't give you that sort of, I, I guess, subjectivity that everyone is hoping to. Right, have. no, I, and I, I think this is an interesting point that you're making and um, uh, it brings out, I think, the difference in the kind of approach that I was trying to defend and the, the hammer off uh, Penrose kind of approach. Because as, and especially the comparison with quantum computing, I think is helpful because there, what they're trying to do is get the superposition to do some work. <laughs> mm -hmm. they, they want the, the quantum mechanical states. Um, yeah. and, and I know Pe and Penrose and Hemrop said stuff like that. They were like, oh, there's got to be a Bose-Einstein con condensed yeah. yeah. stage or something that's doing this. Yeah, so that's a, that's a different kind of theory that says there's something about superpositions um, uh, or being in a superposition or something like that that's important to the exploration of consciousness. So certainly I wasn't trying to suggest that. So there's and, another, so I guess what I would be interested in is what is this alternative? It, can you still call it consciousness causes collapse if you're willing to accept that essentially anything that becomes entangled with the environment is, um, you know, a classical system, right? Can you still? But a classical system in a superposition is not very classical. So if the if the if the system is in a superposition of being spin left and detecting spin left, and also being spin right and detecting spin right, then there still is the question of what why is it that we observe only so the way that I understand decoherence is that you're gonna get like a preferred basis. So you're gonna get some or, orthogonal states um it can either be left or right but it doesn't tell you which of those you're going to get there's nothing That's in the true. math of decoherence that says it's going to be left or it's going to be right you get probabilities and this and the absolute value of their square or whatever is the probability of finding it this way or that way so decoherence yeah. doesn't tell you that the world is classical it says if you looked you would find this result or that result but that's always what quantum mechanics told us, and it's not an advance to add decoherence right. to that. So, but then I guess my argument against a 
a preference for quantum mechanics to be pulled in at this level is that probabilities occur in lots of places right. uh, in this fashion. Um, so like uh, turbulence is a perfectly, you know, like is the plane gonna bounce up and down or down and up, right? Like, that was the, uh, like there, are, there are these, there are probabilistic systems that the only way we know how to model these things, and you can even kind of argue that it's uh, fundamental, like it's as, as accurate as you can get, is to say that you don't know whether it's gonna be this state or that state. But that's not, um, that's not a unique thing to quantum mechanics. This right. happens whenever we have uh, systems that are modeled probabilistically, and it just happens that quantum mechanics is one such system, and, and it does lead to some weirdness in the sense that, um, you know, people are uncomfortable with the determinism being the probability, but that's just the way it is. Uh, it's kind of like, this is the way the world works. The determinism is the probability, uh, or I guess you could say the wave function. So the square, right. of, the, square of the wave function is the thing that is, um, the, the thing you can actually get out, but you're not, you're, you just don't have the um, the this or that that uh, people have come to, to to expect, but that that to me is sort of a different. That's a removed question. So at that level, then it becomes this sort of other question, which is that well, is it all just probabilistic, right? Like, is consciousness a probabilistic mechanism? And then that kind of removes quantum mechanics completely in a way that is maybe a little bit more satisfying to me because I feel like sometimes people pull in quantum mechanics because they love it uh, rather than it being very explanatory. But maybe that's not what you're getting at, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, so, I mean, I think there's a lot I agree with what you're saying there, but so the, so what I was trying, so what I was trying to defend and what I'm, I mean, not that I'm saying it's correct, but the thing that I would be more open to Mm -hmm. is uh, um, a claim about the measurement problem, basically. So wh why do we observe just one outcome instead of what the math predicts, which is a superposition? Um, mm -hmm. So why is it left versus right? Uh, we know the probabilities, the math always matches. We never find um, a, a variance from that. So what do you do? Well, you could either say that there's some objective thing that collapses it to one or the other and you do your collapse theory and that's where I see this kind of theory fitting in. So the theory says, well, what collapses it from the superposition state is that there's a conscious observer who comes to know information about the state. Right. And then people say, well, that's crazy. In consciousness, what are you, a weirdo? And then you say, well, what are, what's your answer to the measurement problem? Oh, yeah. well, you know, we change the equations or, oh, yeah. there's many worlds or, yes. oh, there's. So yeah, I understand. Uh, and so that's, that's the point that I was saying. I it's just as serious to say, and, yeah. and, de and decoherence doesn't rule that out, right? The question, right. and this is kind of von Neumann's yes. famous point was, you know, measure, applying mathematics to the pointer versus to the particle you get the same result, so applying it to the conscious state. I mean, so there's no, the math doesn't tell us where in the chain from detector to us knowing the collapse happens, but there's suggestive things, and you know, this is why I talked about um, uh, the delayed choice quantum eraser, and there's mm -hmm. tons of ways of interpreting it, but one way of interpreting it is that, you know, it's our choice of which measurements we make, which determine whether it acts like a wave or a particle in a given, and we could always choose a different measurement. And so there's something about our conscious agency there that seemingly is playing a role. So why, so why isn't this a possible? And then, so if it's testable, then it's a serious idea. And I think it could be testable. And so that was kind of the argument I was trying to make. So, yeah, so I think, so yeah, I, I agree that at the level of which we do not know what the right interpretation of quantum mechanics is, we don't have an answer to the question and that allows for a wide range of possibilities to be entertained. Uh, my concern with consciousness causes collapse is that it is using consciousness as a crutch where you could use almost anything as a crutch. So it could be instead of consciousness causes collapse, maybe it's, um, you know, the, uh, some of the photons that landed on my deck uh, uh, what, what was the, uh, you know, which did you have more left-handed or right-handed photons that landed 
um, at, at 6 a.m. this morning. Another testable hypothesis, right? At, at the level that I can say that consciousness causes collapse is testable, I can come up with a huge universe of possibilities that could be the thing provoking this, this way, that way sorts of answers. And that's why I don't think just because something is testable, it's necessarily serious because I don't see why consciousness should be the thing that does it compared to any other sort of thing that I might uh, experience, measure, or you know, decide might be correlated. Well, and one I guess one, the the um, the analogy I draw to is I remember I was talking to someone after doing a public lecture who was convinced that gravity would be different depending on chirality. And he said, what you should do is do an equivalence measurement of chiral molecules to see if the um, equivalence principle applied in the same way to right-handed and left-handed molecules. Perfectly testable proposition. Yeah, but no one's gonna do it. No one's gonna do it. And the reason no one's gonna do it is because it's not really a serious proposition because even though no one has looked as to whether this is the case, there's no particular um, motivation to go look for it. And so that's the sense in which I think that consciousness causes collapse is problematic. It's that like, I can see that as being just as legitimate as a huge number of other possibilities that might also provoke the thing to do this or that. Um, and those are equally, you know, and unless I have some like, uh, uh, a good motivation to explore one or the other, I'm gonna choose to sort of ignore that whole universe of possibilities. Um, I, you know, and that's not to say that someone else should go out and try to do these sorts of experiments, but you know, you, you have to kind of decide which things you're gonna invest in. And I'm not someone who invests in quantum, mechanic, quantum mechanical experiments, but if I was sitting on a jury of uninterested scientists, Right, I would want something more compelling than just, oh, you know, it seems like at some level we've made a choice, so maybe this is something we should check. Check because it seems like at some level, perhaps, you know, the sun may have shone shown a different way as well. Maybe that's something you should check. Right, like that's the right. sort of way I think of it. Well, so I wonder what you would say about this because I I've, think I'm sympathetic to the general point you're making. Um, I, I just don't know if I agree that it applies. In this case, although I think, yeah, obviously, if you try to go to a funding agency and say you want to test consciousness in quantum mechanics, probably they're not going to fund you. That may change. Who knows? But uh, so I wonder. So one reason why you might think you should test it is because, so far as we can tell, uh, every everything can be in a superposition at least according to the math of the theory that, and they're getting bigger and bigger stuff. You know, I mean, I heard, I read something about diamonds recently and they, you know, there's the, if there's a famous uh, buckyball molecule or whatever. So um, in limit, there's should, everything can be in a superposition um, mm -hmm. because the theory, that's just the way things work. However, we know directly from experience that consciousness is never in superposition because we don't experience things that way. So from our own first person perspective, we have some definitive, I would say, evidence that there's one thing which doesn't go into a superposition or resist it very strongly. That's conscious experience. Everything else that we have ever met is something that can do that. So this seemingly is uh, an interesting special thing that we should look into. Yeah, I guess my question is, first of all, to the extent that we don't consciously experience superposition, why can't the explanation simply be that consciousness is classical? You know? Well, what do you mean is that? Yeah, well, then it would be, you know, not like I mean, a physical thing. <laughs> no, no. Kind of like a boring explanation, but to the extent to which, you know, where our neurons are behaving classically, it's very difficult for us to you know, have a superposition of thoughts because you can't really have a superposition of synapses. But yeah, why, yeah, you can actually, in principle, have a superposition of synapses. Why not? Um, I don't know that that's been demonstrated. It'd be interesting to see, <laughs> but yeah. Well, it hasn't been demonstrated, but what has been demonstrated is that uh, it's only technological and energy limits 
onto what you can put in superpositions. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the case, but it's also kind of specialized, right? Like it's like, yeah, diamonds and buckyballs are real interesting systems. They're also extremely well ordered. So it's like a very well posed problem to put them into superpositions. Uh, trying to put a virus into a superposition, that's gonna be a little bit more difficult. You know, trying to put a bacterium into, you know, like at some level you start to become problematized because of the, the classical world, right? Because all of a sudden- But, the, but there is no classical world. There's only the quantum mechanical world and then- Yeah, but to the <laughs> extent that things are behaving like classical things, you can't put them in superposition, right? Like I can't put two billiard balls in superposition, even though you could calculate that given, you know, an infinite monkey's worth of experience, eventually you could get them to be in the same location, right? But try as you might, you're gonna push them together over and over and over again. They're never gonna occupy the same position. Well, you can't experience them being in superposition, but as far as I understand quantum mechanics is a general theory about physical nature and that system would evolve into an entangled Super mixed state. There is, a, there is a small but finite probability that you could do this. Right. It's so remote that for all practical purposes, it doesn't occur. And that's the extent to which, you know, I see biological systems not behaving quantum mechanically. And also, so then that, so then that's not a compelling, because if we're saying that, and I don't even know that I understand precisely what we mean by not experiencing superpositions consciously, but I'll even grant that, like that we don't do that. I don't see why the explanation can't just simply be because consciousness is based on things that behave classically. That may not even be a satisfying explanation, but at least it's like, all right, that, that kind of, fulfills my, my desire to have regimes. And I say, okay, so there's the regime of the biological world above about the level of atoms, or you could even have systems of maybe dozens of atoms in certain situations that were very uh, carefully chosen. But anything above that, things behave classically. And, and, and that's where biology happens. So biology is classical, that sort of thing. And yeah. that to me would be a compelling sort of counter to someone who said, well, but I, it's, you know, consciousness is the one place I don't, we don't see superpositions. So maybe that's telling us something about how quantum mechanics works. And to me, that's not a compelling argument because of that, because biology, and I think that consciousness is related to biology, the biological world, uh, because biology, biology happens in the classical regime, I'm not surprised that consciousness behaves in this, to the extent that we're claiming it does as a, as a classical thing. So I guess that would be my rejoinder would be, I mean, that's that, if that were the case, yeah, that would be really compelling. If, the, if it really was the situation where like the only time we didn't see superposition at all was with, let's say like you could never see uh, synapses right? Then that would be compelling, right? Like if you could make that claim, then I'd be like, yeah, then that's something we should go investigate. But I don't see that necessarily being the case, right? Like I don't see that as being somehow special or if you didn't, if you had some other model of consciousness, whatever it was, right? I mean, it seems like what you're saying is, I mean, in one sense, kind of strange. Uh, I mean, in another sense, obviously I agree that I, part of me, is on board of what you're saying. I think that consciousness is a product of biology um, uh, in a fairly like flat-footed sense. But I mean, so it sounds like what you're saying is that you think that there are the two world theorems. There's the world that's described by quantum mechanics, it's the small world. And then there's the classical world, which is the meat size, the dry goods stuff. Yeah. Um, that's like a classic kind of Copenhagen-esque view that we need the, the concepts of the classical world that they come prior, uh, to the quantum mechanical stuff, but so that, they, that they emerge out of the quantum mechanical world, I guess, is the way I would think of it. Which is what decoherence is supposed to be all about, right? Like the classical merge world emerging out of a quantum mechanical. Uh, fundamentally, we're all quantum mechanical. I think we're all in agreement about that. Like at the basis of everything, quantum mechanics has to be correct. And to the extent that, like, I can't push my 
hand through the table that's due to quantum mechanics and, and like there's all sorts of fun things that we can talk about but to, to the extent that i can model a roller coaster right even though that's ultimately due to quantum mechanics it's sort of pointless to try to model that way because we have uh an emerging classical world that works very well and the classical if you were to if you were to ignore quantum mechanics and give yourself a classical world um my uh, proposal is that uh, uh, consciousness could come out of that. It could come out of that, and there's no particular reason to abandon that as a um, as a regime qualification. That your yeah. whole of consciousness has to be classical. So, I guess this is just where we're going to end up fundamentally disagreeing, yeah. uh, because I mean, so there's lots of things that I guess I would say. So one is that I think. I would not be very surprised that quantum mechanics had something important to do about biology. You know, we, the, the discovery of photosynthesis using- Oh, there's um, definitely so quantum. There's, the, there's quantum biology. So certainly life, I mean, if that's the fundamental nature of reality, then certainly it's not surprising that life would have evolved to take advantage of that. I don't think that would be that big of a, a mystery or that big of a surprise. But so, I mean, cause, so for, from, from my point of view, it does not seem to me that the the you know standard model of particle physics quantum mechanic field theory uh quantum field theory with maybe some super string undertones or something like that um it does not seem to me that that theory tells you that before there were observers there was a definite path that a particle took it seems like what it predicts is that well it could have gone any number of ways and until you observe you're not going to know which way it went or uh that it went anyway so i just don't see that the argument that the world is classical boils down to more than that um there's going to be a massive entangled set, uh, state of a bunch of classical seeming outcomes but which one of those becomes the one you observe depends on the observation so I, I, there's nothing in what you were saying about the classical nature of the world, which suggests that that picture isn't correct. Um, and that, so the superposition of us talking right now and the call being dropped or whatever else you want to add to it, uh, would be determined one way or another by the involvement of our experience. That's a, that's the claim that I'm, I'm trying to suggest is not a, a silly claim, but it's it, it's not going to be refuted by saying oh but there's a kind of classical system there because you still haven't answered the question why do we find the results that we find instead of the superposition of the of the two states so i never observe the pointer being up and down i observe it one or the other but the math right. says it's in a combination state so, so that, yeah so i guess i don't i would i wouldn't say that this is a refutation either like i wouldn't say that i don't think that there is a possible reputation because at the basis like why we're able to have the discussion in the first place is because we don't know what yeah. the interpretation of quantum mechanics is and so my uh skepticism isn't so much on the basis of saying you're not allowed to have this opinion right or that it's i mean i guess i say it's not serious in the sense of funding agencies and I actually think it's interesting to think about why funding agencies wouldn't fund this. And I don't think it's just because they're prejudiced against people who are interested in the subject. I actually do think that it has to, although it obviously could be, right? Like you shouldn't discount that aspect. Yeah. <laughs> like I do think that there's another argument that can be made besides that, which is that there are, when you don't know what the answer is, it, the answer can almost literally be anything. And so w to that extent, it seems like this is a very small possibility in the grand scheme. And this, the extent to which other interpretations of quantum mechanics are taken so-called seriously or entertained more for better or worse, and I actually don't have any irons in that fire <laughs> whatsoever, I really, I actually don't even know what it is. I don't know what the answer is. I'm interested in the question. I'm interested in the arguments that people have, but I don't see a compelling way one way or another. 
Um, but to, to the extent that you could open up to a huge range of possibilities of interpretations, you suddenly start to enter, entertain even more and more wild uh, uh, ideas, which is fine, but you, that's, that's where I, I see that explanation happening. I see it in the realm of lots and lots of different things that you, know, you could come up with, and why should we preference? I don't, I don't see a, it. Ultimately, I don't see a reason to preference consciousness over any other sort of thing that you could imagine might be correlated that could explain some of it. It's, at least it's less weird than many worlds. I mean, that's bizarre. Yeah, it's, but it's, less we, we, it's less we, weird than uh, Bamian secret hidden so I'll variable be, holes. I'll yeah. this. It's more testable than many worlds right now. So that's kind of nice. On the other hand, I don't think many worlds people are asking to test their <laughs> interpretations. Right, they're right. not gonna be they're not gonna be the competitors, right? Like so and that's that's actually a, a sort of an interesting question. Like how do you go about testing interpretations of quantum mechanics? And I think the answer has to lie at a level that's well below this question of uh, conscious which way sorts of experiments, where yeah. you actually have to understand how things like the uh, uh, quantum erasers work and things like this. If you have to really get down deep into some of these things, or yeah. you know what what the insert what regimes there's still open questions about how the uncertainty principle applies like things like, like very fundamental things we don't know about the uh ways that we understand quantum mechanics to work and so that's the extent to which i can see like investigation happening uh, i think it's premature to set up you know it, you know, it could be revolutionary in a sense, but again, you have to kind of make these decisions uh, whether or not it's worth setting up a, a ghost like experiment for chiral molecules. You know, like you have to kind of decide is that something that we're prepared to do at this point? Is there enough sort of motivation? And I just don't see the motivation as being very strong uh, for CCC to be something to be taken as an interpretation again and i will grant that it is testable it's fantastically testable so that's like a great way that's something that's going for it and, and you sh it should be held on to but i don't i myself do not think that just because something is testable it should be tested um i think there needs to be a better motivation and that's kind of where i lie yeah then i think that's very interesting i, I mean and I'm, you know, I don't put a lot of credence into this. I think this is the most interesting of the kind of um, strange ideas. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, when you when you work on consciousness like I do, uh, you meet a lot of strange ideas. Yeah. I, I like to, I part the philosopher part of me likes thinking about them. Um, right. the, the scientist part of me thinks I want data on these kinds of questions. But when when you get down to it, it's really hard to see what would count um, as kind of data against these overarching metaphysical positions like materialism dualism yeah. idealism yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like okay yeah i'm a materialist but what empirical evidence is there you can say some stuff about history of science and success but it's um it, it gets tricky really quickly as yeah. i'm sure you're aware but i mean my only claim that i wanted to establish what or to to consider was that it's less severe than all of the other things. I mean, many worlds interpretation boggles the mind. Uh, the Bamian interpretation is, I, I, I would say empirically not equivalent to quantum mechanics, uh, but I think there's some trickiness in the math. You have yeah, to do a lot of details, but uh, it, people will debate that. And then, um, but it's still weird to postulate that there's a hidden kind of variable that's being guided, there's a pilot wave. It's I don't know. It just it just seems extravagant. Um, whereas in in this case, it 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 seems to me that the you either going to have to recognize the role that the observer plays in quantum mechanics, and the only two ways to do that are the some kind of Copenhagen interpretation, um, where it just boils down to what what kind of questions we can ask and uh, how nature will ask them, answer them, or that consciousness is a real physical process. That plays a role in bringing about the physical results. I, I really don't see. I see the other ones as being really kind of ex theoretically extravagant, um, whereas these ones are 
simpler. <laughs> so therefore, should be preferred. Yeah, a, there is a simplicity to assuming that everything's happening behind a like a a, a, a curtain of consciousness, because you can like have then you can have your whole discussion about what those models actually are that interact. I guess, um, and so like yeah, that I can understand, and that was indeed kind of the. <laughs> impetus for the Copenhagen meetings anyway, right? Like, yeah, right. That, that was the problem that they were frustrated with because they were like, we can't have this, right? But then like, I think that's actually where the, the discussion should happen, right? Why is it that people say we can't have that? And it's, I don't think it's solely a prejudice against the idea. I think that there is some fundamentally like sound arguments for what the heuristic uh, development of consciousness ultimately is going to look like. Yes, we don't have it. Yes, it's still a mystery. Yes, it could be completely wrong, but I don't think that people are being um, uh, needlessly dismissive to um, uh, uh, provoke this kind of uh, resistance to uh, using consciousness as the, the thing that determines or the thing that decides. Uh, I mean, the one thing, though, though, just really quickly, though, I mean, the one thing that I think we, you and I both agree on is that there is something that needs to be said about quantum mechanics here. Uh, I think there's a mystery so, in quantum mechanics. I yeah. don't know how it's going to resolve. It may resolve in the same way that, like, the mystery of what life is resolves, in that there is no real resolution. It's just kind of something that, like, people realize, maybe it's, like, just a matter of, perspective we just haven't really come to terms with the way quantum mechanics works and right. I, I actually asked a question i sent you an email and one of the questions i asked was um part of the re part of the reason i think that people find quantum mechanics to be spooky uh impossible to understand etc cetera, etc cetera, is because um what we really don't understand and what we really have problems with is wave mechanics yeah that wave mechanics is is difficult but like Almost all, yeah, it, with very few exceptions, almost all of the phenomena associated with quantum mechanics um, that people find uh, spooky or un, like, incredible is something that you can find in any wave, right? Like it comes from signal processing and it comes from things like Fourier transforms, which people deal with. And they don't really realize that, yeah, the uncertainty principle is there. Yeah, right. It is. It just it shows is, yeah. up. And like, actually, the, the interesting thing about quantum mechanics is the extent to which it is classical, the extent to which you get discrete things rather than continuous things. Uh, but that's not usually the, it, you know, the, the mystery. We don't actually understand why that is at all, <laughs> which is equally interesting to me in a way. Um, but that that doesn't get as much play as sort of these other questions and that really center around a fundamental disconnect between the way we experience the world as particle like things yeah. versus the way a wave like thing would experience the world. And so th that was sort of one of my tongue in cheek questions, which I think might be worthy of thinking about. It's like if we were waves instead of particles, you know, would this whole question be turned on its head? And we were like, you know. You know, it's super strange that, you know, uh, there are um, uh, situations where you can stop getting interference patterns and, you know, like, <laughs> and I guess it, 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 imagine switching the whole perspective, you get um, like this sort of questions. It, 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 I wonder whether the unknown aspects and the like mysterious aspects of quantum mechanics just are coming from sort of a, a more fundamental place. Yeah. Kind of the excitement that is generated by who advanced physics, quantum mechanics. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's an interesting point. I, I tell you, a lot of it had to do with the non commuting <laughs> nature of, of, yeah. the, of the linear algebra. Um, but there's a lot of, I mean, so uh, the big difference with the classical stuff is that that's all interpreted as epistemic limitations. Mm -hmm. um, whereas it, the challenge of quantum mechanics, it doesn't seem like there's a good way of having it merely be our knowledge of the system, which is uncertain, as opposed to the states of the system itself uh, being fundamentally characterized this way. 
Um, so that's why I, I would kind of resist that characterization that the weirdness is in the, in the wave phenomenon. Um, because we know how to deal with that. And we say, well, it's just due to our lack of ability to calculate it or lack of ability to have all the information. Um, but the, the real, I mean, the, the real resistance is, is to the notion of superposition that there can be states which are not classical. And a lot of the, by which I mean having definite values at a, at a before, before being measured. Um, so I think that, that's where I would, a lot of the resistance to quantum mechanics comes from the idea that before you measure, there's no definitive states, no classically definitive yeah, states. Yeah, I think that's yeah. great. But all, a lot of that comes from situations that, you know, we cannot be in the same place as someone else, right? Because <laughs> we're particles, but waves can. Like waves have no problem being in the same place as another wave. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so it's like this weird sort of thing where I think that the, I, I agree that it's not coming out of this um, lack of knowledge situation, but it is, it is a, uh, I would say almost a phenomenological discomfort. That yeah. No, I see what you're saying, but but even there, we have a way of understanding it. When the two waves are in the same place, their energy sums total, or they cancel out, or to yeah. one degree or another. But it's hard to understand what that means when we're talking about being up or down, or left or right, or located here, or located there. And so it's really the idea that these so-called classical properties are wave-like in their nature. Not just that there are wave-like things, yes. um, but that, that things that we didn't think of as waves really are or exhibit wave -like. Right, so I guess that's sort of the th thing that it, it's still, you know, when I teach students quantum mechanics, um, the thing I usually spend the most time on is um, getting to understand how waves work. Yeah because, right, like, it is weird that you can have an interference pattern and then there's no energy at point A, but there's two waves at point A, right? Like, that is, that is strange to me and should be strange to anybody that isn't a wave. But a wave <laughs> would not find that to be strange at all, right? It yeah, seems right. to me. They would be perfect. They, they would find the, the fact that you would say that there's somehow a problem with that to be strange. That's kind of the way I, I wonder about some of these sorts of things. And I think some of this also gets into the um, way that it has been popularized, I guess, because yeah. that's sort of the thing that everyone gets excited about. And so I worry a little bit, the same, same way that I worry about detection and measurement, because I was taught it wrong in the sense that um, it absolutely is not the situation where, you know, if you run an experiment and somehow like <laughs> write down the results in a notebook and then tear the paper out of the notebook and throw it away, that you recover the interference pattern or something like that, right? Like it, it doesn't have to do with the act of measurement um, that we describe in a laboratory, right? Or like that I would have my students do. It has to do with something fundamental about detection and what we mean by this. Um, and that's very delicate, right? Because we don't often come in contact with that as being a, an information flow question, right? We're often thinking of, you know, two, if we're thinking classically, we think of two things colliding and then going off in two different directions. Uh, but, you know, unless you really kind of spent a long time, you don't think about how that is a detection of some sort and that uh, that's a measurement of some sort. And it didn't involve me writing down answers or like recording it or really any consciousness at all, right? It, it just was the collision that occurred and two things go off. And so, yeah, I don't know that we've... Um, I mean, that's probably a whole other matter, but I think that some of the confusion also lies in what the words that we use um, imply about how quantum mechanics and physics in general work. So. Right, so you think detection is a better word than measurement? I, I sort of think that. Um, 
I don't know that I have a good answer for this, but I do know that this has caused problems where like people think of measurement as, it's easy to see the word measurement as involving consciousness. Um, like that's just, it makes sense. How do you measure something? You've got to be there to do it, right? Yeah. You have to, you, someone has to communicate it to you or you have to communicate it to someone else. Like that's the fundamental, like even if you talk about standards of measure, right? Like it's all about, oh, can we agree on what this and that? And, but that's not really what we're talking about when we talk about quantum mechanics experiments that are so-called measuring quantum. Well, it might be. I mean, I think that's what one way of seeing the debate that we've been having. Right, that's one way of seeing the debate. But I think <laughs> that that might be what a measurement it is. It, it, it makes people uncomfortable. But I mean, it's, so it's, it, this gets back to what you were saying, what the real uncomfortability, why people resist it. So that, I, I don't know. I just think people are wedded to classical notions. I mean, People bend over backwards to try to recover the classical world um, instead of just accepting that the world is fundamentally quantum mechanical. Uh, that's a whole impetus for bombing mechanics. I mean, that, like there's got to be some definitive thing with a definite property. It's just hidden. Oh, okay, uh, but why must there be? <laughs> why? Why isn't it perfectly fine to say before measurement there's no detection, there's no definitive state, there's no localized property. I mean, I just don't see what the, the real driving force to all of this is the, the kind of idea that there's got to be the world's classical. It's got to be that way. Yeah. But that just seems wrong to me. I don't, I don't know why we don't trust the physics. The world's not classical. Experience is classical. Yeah, we experience things classically, but that's not how the fundamental nature of the world is. At least if you think of in terms of the way the physics is unfolding, it just seems to me wrong to say that the world is classical. It's, it's not. Um, it's experience, which is classical. But I, that's the, I think that's where we're just kind of, we're going to disagree because, right. but so I would diagnose your side <laughs> as being the type of people who want to say, look, the world just got to, I, I can't give up this idea that at its nature, there's a classical world with things having definite properties, even when no one's around. Whereas my side is saying, look, but the science is telling us, let go of that. The world is not classical. Don't cling to that. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know which one is right, but I, I don't know why the insistence on the classical nature of the world is so important. Well, I guess the, I, I don't know that it's classical so much as it's deterministic, maybe. Right? Yeah, that's, class, that's, what, that's what classical means. It means that there is a determinant state that has determinate properties which evolve in a determinate way into states with determinate properties at yeah. future times. I, when I when I talk about classical, I I mean something much more specific though. I mean that something is following classical mechanics. It's following like a set of like explanations that were developed out of Newtonian and Hamiltonian descriptions of right. reality. That's the same thing. They are deterministic in one way, but they also can yield sort of intriguingly non-deterministic situations, um, uh, which is why you know people get excited about emergence, right? Like that's the sort of. But that just goes back to the point that we were, I think, talking about a second ago, which is that um, even on the picture that I would defend, although I'm not endorsing, there's going to be sets of orthogonal bases <laughs> which uh, are classical looking. So you're going to get that, you know, to take Schrodinger's cat example, you're going to get as the preferred basis, the cat's alive or the cat's dead. That looks very ca classical. Um, but you still end up with a superposition of those, that the cat is in a state of the sum of those two vectors. And that's not a classical state. <laughs> that's not something that's determinate. Um, in the way that that you want it to be. Uh, it's only when it's measured that you get a determinate state of the cat being not, either alive like or dead. It's not classical in a in a mean sense, right? Like, yeah, cats don't behave this way, but you can get energy to behave that way. And it's still, you know, classical electrodynamics still applies perfectly fine with situations like that. And so I don't think that we've worked through all of our psychological difference difficulties with coming to terms with that the the crossover that's occurred. 
And that's kind of the way it, it seems to me. Interesting. Um, I can understand the, I, 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 where I definitely agree with you is that we ultimately are at a quantum mechanical world. And I also, I, I think I agree even down to the level of saying that these sorts of superpositions exist um, uh, even in a classical, you know, sense. Uh, but where I think I don't, um, where I think we may part ways is I don't see that as being, uh, having any implications whatsoever <laughs> for uh, uh, reality as it's experienced um, by a human being, for example. I don't see any um, chance for that to be necessarily meaningful. And I'm, I'm very open to being shown that that's incorrect, right? Like for example, in situations with photosynthesis, like there's some profoundly quantum mechanical stuff that's going on, or, right. you know, there could be, uh, radioactivity is profoundly quantum mechanical. Like I can point to things that are phenomenologically quantum mechanical that you really need quantum mechanics to explain that can have extremely uh, macroscopic uh, consequences, but um, but that's the the sort of I, I I I I sort of feel like there's this tension about the weirdness of quantum mechanics, um, and I and I'm not certain that 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 that, that advertised feature of it is is perhaps. Uh, provoking more push in directions that may be unreasonable than, um, than I'm comfortable with, I guess that's the way I'd say. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I, I could be talking with you for hours and hours, but <laughs> I can't keep you forever. So okay. I wonder if there's anything that's come, that hasn't come up yet. I, it's hard to imagine, but anything that you would like to bring up before we go? No, I think this is pretty good. I think I have a good understanding of where you're coming from. Um, you know, the, I guess the, yeah, I still sort of fundamentally don't understand the hard problem of consciousness, but I'm also feeling like, you know, there's, I, I actually think the first question I asked you is still one I don't, I would really like to understand. <laughs> which is why is it that there's such this disconnect between people who like accept that the hard problem of consciousness is something that needs to be dealt with and people who think it's not a thing almost, right? Like, it, it, like why, why, how, how do you cross that divide? And I just still don't know the answer to that. It's a it's a one I struggle with every day. That's part of partly why I have people over here talking about this stuff because yeah, I I mean I've talked to panpsychists and functionalists, illusionists. Yeah. They're all pretty convinced <laughs> yeah, of, of their own approach. It's right. interesting to 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 ask that question. I'm not really sure what the answer is myself. I think some of the stuff we talked about at the beginning is about as as close as you're gonna be able to get to an answer. Right. Um, that people, you know, people put a lot of emphasis on their first personal experience. Yeah. And, it's, you know, yeah. I mean, as a philosophy major growing up, you know, you, you, you take your undergraduate class on Descartes and Descartes says, this could be a dream. And I don't even know if I have a body and, you know, you're like, whoa, I don't even know if I have a body. Uh, at that point, it just seems to me, if you can do that, you've left what, what you're left with is just conscious experience. That's what you're imagining. You're imagining that all I am is consciousness. Yeah. Um, and that's something every undergraduate is forced to do if they take intro to philosophy. It doesn't seem that hard to do. And at that point, Descartes kind of convinces us, look, the thing you know with certainty is that you're this conscious being, you have experience. Yeah. So when the dentists of the world come along and say, hey, you could be a zombie, you don't know you're not a zombie. It just is, uh, I, I mean, I see the kind of philosophical point they're making, but I can't take that seriously. I, I, I just can't entertain the possibility that I don't have conscious experience. And the reason I can't is because I have it. <laughs> and right. so uh, th that's not negotiable. Like I know I have conscious experience and I know there are questions about what its nature is and all that stuff, but I can't, I can't understand how someone could be convinced that, yeah, there's no pain, that there's what we call conscious pain isn't a thing. 
when I have them all the times, I have migraines, I have achy joints, I eat food, I taste it. It's like, that's what consciousness is. It's those things. We all know it. We all have it. Um, the question is, how do you explain it or understand it? Not, is it there? So when, when the illusionists of the world set up the problem as convince me that consciousness is real, I just don't understand what the challenge really is because yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's like, that's, this is just like basic level stuff. Like you, it was like, kick. I mean, if I was once at a talk with a famous philosopher said, what should I do? Pinch myself and publish the results in the journal of philosophy. The answer to this question is no, you should pin someone else <laughs> and have them publish the results. Uh, but if you don't take that as a serious source of evidence, then you're going to, you know, have these sorts of discussions. Right. So the dentist of the world, when what Dennis says when you tell him this is what you've said, basically, he says, yeah, that's a data point that I need to explain that there are people who have these weird ideas that they have conscious experience and that they might not be zombies. So I'll put that as a data point over here and there's a bunch of data points. And then what I want is a theory that explains why people, sometimes people say that, but sometimes people say it not that. Mm -hmm. And that's heterophenomenology, basically, where you start from the outside and just take the explain the reports of, of the other people. So he doesn't even recognize as there being something that is a source of data or need of explanation that there is something called consciousness. Yeah. And that just seems to me to like lose the game at the beginning. Like as a, as a materialist, as a physicalist person, what I want is for consciousness to be physical. I want it to be a brain process. And I want it to be conscious as I want it to be this thing that seems mysterious. I want that to be physical, not some other imaginary thing. So, so that's sort of a rhetorical uh, mistake. I think that a lot of physicalists make is they say, look, consciousness is not real. When that just, I mean, I, that's, I don't know if I'd say it's the silliest claim ever made. That's what Galen Strassen famously said about it. I don't think I'd say that, but it's certainly a very bizarre, Play. I mean, go and tell someone about epiphenomenalism. Uh, consciousness exists, but it doesn't cause anything. They, the, the ordinary people find that to be incredibly bizarre because we think of consciousness as so a part of our lives and the cause of our behaviors. Yeah. So it's only, that's the only thing I think that's gonna motivate people. Now, of course, I'm not gonna say that it, I, I trust my first person specialness so much that I'm gonna say, panpsychism or dualism um, or something like that. But I, but I can see why people would be, if you really are convinced that there's something that we're actually confronted with, not giving any explanation of that or explaining away is ignoring a huge half of the data, like the most important part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, to me, like, that I would never start with Descartes as my yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, groundwork. Like I would start with Carl Sagan, right? And like the first thing that he does is ask you to question what you've seen and what you know and what you think that you have known about your own personal experience if you're going to evaluate sort of like claims. When, but Carl Sagan doesn't ask you to, to question whether you have experience. No, he doesn't, but he does ask. So I, I, so for me, I'm not as convinced, and I actually don't know that I've, I'm clear that Dennett is necessarily convinced either that the answer is absolutely that consciousness is an illusion. Perhaps he does think this. But I think that it is a reasonable uh, hypothesis that's hard to disprove that has some intriguing characteristics in the sense that it is um, uh, uh, like in an Occam's razor sense, kind of simple. Um, and you can argue against those sorts of predilections that I have, but like that to me is the sense where, where it's intriguing. Not that I think it's correct, but that it is something that, you know, needs to be dealt with fundamentally because I can understand it yeah. Whereas I, I definitely think people that are first person subjectivist in that sense, like don't even understand it in the, not in like the sense that they can't articulate it, but in the sense that they, they think that it's like, they can't a it. yeah. Um, and that's sort of fantastic to me in the sense that, you know, I'm very skeptical of my own uh, experience. Right? Like I think of my own experience as being easily manipulated by external variables that I have no control over. And so that's kind of why I, I don't take much stock in what I 
myself feel like of course i go around thinking that like i cause things to move and i you know but i don't consider that to be evidence that that's actually what's happening i just think of it as this is the way i operate and but, but that my have... experience though is not i mean so i get what you're saying like the sense of agency um uh, it, we're often buffeted about by the environment and confabulate reasons for what we do. Body but, sense, whatever it is, right? Like whatever it is. That there is that experience is not open for that sort of questioning. Right. right. That's, that's right. I don't, I do not say that that doesn't exist in the sense that like, it's, um, not something that is experienced by me, but I don't necessarily think that it's problematic to explain that as it being illusion and or to explain it as being something that is, um, you know, uh, perhaps asking the wrong question, right? Like for something like that. You know? Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, that's where I. I mean, I understand illusionism as an abstract idea. And actually, when I think, what I think is that when you actually talk to people who are illusionists, they end up mysteriously not being illusionists. <laughs> what they what they really are are telling you is that we we don't understand the nature of consciousness and that its real nature is not what is commonsensically thought so that they that they're trying to debunk a bad theory which is yeah, usually I think that's, that's the impression i get it's it's a it's almost like the um it strikes me a little bit and maybe this is uh instructive in a weird way but um, the story of special relativity in the 1950s and 60s, you know the story of Herbert Dingle? Uh -uh. <laughs> Herbert Dingle was an astronomer who was convinced special relativity was wrong. And so he started coming up with all of these preposterous paradoxes that special relativity seemed to indicate about how things, and, and, and these paradoxes have now become standard uh, thought experiments that we teach to students because they're so illustrative. But he was convinced that it was completely wrong. So I think in that sense, it might be that illusionism is wrong, but I think it might be extremely instructive in that way. So Herbert Dingle, for example, proposed the twin paradox, which right. most people don't I, really understand. I thought, yeah, they say Einstein did that. The twin right. paradox was proposed by Herbert Dingle because it actually is a paradox, if you're not careful, because no one twin, both twins should, ex should if they observe the other twin, see the other twin who is moving to be time dilated. And that's a paradox because when they come back together, how can they possibly both have seen time dilation? One twin has to be older than the other. And Herbert Dingle said, and there's no way for you to know which twin is older than the other. And of course, there actually is a way and it has you know, to do with some really interesting ways of how you answer the particular question um, it has to do with switching reference frames, and it's it's a beautiful thought experiment. But that's the sort of way I think of it. It's like you need you need those kind of like real contrarian people, and maybe they're completely wrong. Herbert Dingle was wrong. Like special relativity is right, but it was extremely it was great that he did that in a sense because now we have this like excellent pedagogical um, list of things we can go through to explain. Yeah. How so that same with uh, EPR. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. This is sort of a similar sort of thing, right? Yeah, like that's interesting. Belsky Rosen had the same issue. So I, I think of illusionism as kind of like that. It's actually informing us in a sense about how we might need to problematize the questions that we're asking about consciousness. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I didn't know that about Dingle. I've always, uh, I guess, thought that that was attributed to Einstein, the twin paradox. <laughs> no, he, Einstein did not mention the, the twin paradox came decades after. But, In the uh, 20s, yeah, wow, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah. Okay, well, very good. This has been a great discussion, uh, Josh. I really enjoyed talking yeah, with you. Um, and I, 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 you know, I think more people talk about these issues, the better, even, right. even if we end up not agreeing, like you were saying, it's important yeah. to have these discussions. So I want to uh, say thank you for that. And, um, just stay on for a second. I'll say bye after I stop recording. Okay, sounds good. Bye.